Hi, everyone. I'm Jody Kilvasa, director of the Virginia Film Festival and vice provost for the arts at the University of Virginia. I'm pleased to welcome you tonight to this special Virginia Film Festival Beyond the Screen event, reflecting reality with a cast of Grey's Anatomy in Station 19, moderated by Virginia Film Festival program manager Chandler Fairby. Grey's Anatomy, now in its 17th season, is one of the most popular and longest running series on the air today and is for its portrayal of the personal and professional lives of Meredith Gray and her colleagues at Seattle's Gray Sloan Memorial Hospital. A spinoff of Gray's Anatomy, Station 19, centers around a group of heroic firefighters in Seattle as they risk their lives and hearts, both in the line of duty and off the clock. We're so very excited to welcome Jason George back to his alma mater. Many of you may not know that Jason was on his way to becoming a lawyer until, on a whim, he and a friend decided to take a drama class here at UVA. We certainly think you'll all agree he made the right choice. We are thrilled to welcome him back and to have him as a valued member of our Virginia Film Festival Advisory Board. We extend a warm welcome to Jason, who plays Dr. Ben Warren on Grey's Anatomy in Station 19, and all of his colleagues for this special evening. And we want to thank Jason Chandler and the team at Shondaland for their work in making it happen. I'm sure that most of you watching these folks need no introduction, so I will keep this brief. Kevin McKidd, who plays Dr. Owen Hunt on Grey's Anatomy in Station 19, has also directed several episodes of Grey's. He's also known for his work as Tommy McKenzie and Danny Boyle's acclaimed film, Train Spotting. Kim Raver, who plays surgeon and Iraq veteran, Dr. Teddy Altman on Grey's Anatomy, joined the show in 2009 for a three-year run and then rejoined the cast in 2017. She is also known for his work for her role as Audrey Raines in the Emmy-nominated 24 Live Another Day, and for her work on Showtime's Ray Donovan. Boris Kojo is known for his role in the television series Soul Food, earning him three NAACP nominations for Outstanding Supporting Actor. In 2019, he joined ABC's hit action drama series Station 19 as a series regular. Kojo also appeared on the final season of House of Cards. Krista Vernoff is an Emmy-nominated screenwriter, showrunner, executive producer, and director. She currently runs Grey's Anatomy and Station 19, in addition to her new series for ABC, Rebel. Krista has also worked as executive producer and writer for Shameless and producer-writer on Charmed and Wonderfalls. Finally, we thank tonight's sponsor, the Jefferson Trust, for the generous support of our 2021 Beyond the Screen season. Thank you all for joining us this evening, and now I'll let you get started. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for taking time out of your super busy schedules to do this with me and thank you to Jason and Shondaland for helping put this together. This is, I'm so excited. I'm such a fan of both of the shows. And when I started watching it again, after the hiatus, I wonder, you know, do I want to watch something about the pandemic? Is that something I'm going to want to get into? But there was something about watching these characters that I know and love go through the things that I've been going through, or my mom, who was a nurse on the COVID unit for a portion of the pandemic is going through. And there was something very comforting about that. And, you know, these two shows have been able to have such a nice conversation with each other. And Grey's, you know, for 17 seasons has been a great example of diversity on screen and talking about major issues on screen. And those are things that everyone is just now starting to come around to that Grey's has been there for. And it's, Station 19 is such a great companion piece to that and the conversations they've been able to have together. So I'm so excited to be able to get into this conversation with you all. Um, So, Take me back to the beginning. It's the height of the pandemic. You're on hiatus. You portray first responders every day at work. What was that like watching that unfold and having that perspective? Jason. Who wants to go first? Shall Not I, all shall at I once. <laughs> uh, I got thrown under the bus. No, it, um, it was powerful uh, because we've all become we have a number of doctors on the writing staff, uh, some of whom sneak in front of the camera. Uh, over at Grey's Anatomy, we have a lot of firefighters. 
uh, as our technical coordinators. So these are our friends. And uh, for me, I, I know that one of the most powerful moments was when one of our uh, fire technical advisors gave me a call and invited me to a clap out, which is when the firefighters, police officers, all the people we normally think of as first responders go to the hospital and applaud the changing of the shifts at the hospital because for the first time in memory, they're the front line. Uh, usually it's the paramedics and the firefighters and the police officers who are in the thick of it, but uh, it's the, it was this time it was the doctors and nurses and all the medical professionals who are risking their lives day in and day out and seeing untold amounts of you know, misery. And so they would show up and they crossed the ladder trucks. They raised the ladders up and crossed them in the air. A helicopter buzzed over top. And I teared up because you realize that, you know, what it meant to all these people. And we get to portray these people on a regular basis. So it was, uh, that was before we even got back into production. So I just shot Krista a video in the email and said, this is going to be crazy. And, uh, and we've got to do it justice. And she was way, way ahead of me. So and, uh, I'll, I'll just leave it there. I, um, I think it takes uh, extraordinary amounts of courage to um, not shy away from these, kind of, these kinds of uh, uh, conversations and dialogue. And um, you know, knowing Krista and um, her support system, uh, that's, and who, that's who I'm in awe of, you know, uh, because they have proven time and time again that they don't shy away from, from these kinds of conversations. And, and I think that's so important because we're living in a time of so many pandemics. There's so many issues that, that uh, we've been sort of fallen with. And, and uh, I mean, if you were at my dinner table at night with my two teenagers, um, those are conversations that I never thought I would have, especially not at this age. And um, to be able to uh, represent that on television, on a network, uh, and have those real conversations, honest, authentic conversations, every single time we step in front of the camera, has been truly eye-opening and mm. uh, has been an honor as well. Because like Jason said, we represent these, these real-life heroes. So to, to be able to say words that are true and authentic and, and real in so many ways, to, uh, especially according to who we play, and because each of us has a different personal experience of these of these events, uh, has been tremendous. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, one of the things that jumps out at me was when we we're all in kind of August. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, we were kind of all getting ready to come back, and I remember I was actually because you know during that lockdown period you couldn't go on vacation, and I rented an RV like I think a lot of people did. You know, we went and tried to do an RV vacation with the kids, you know, socially distanced, which was impossible. Um, and we and I was driving back and we had this big meeting, big Zoom meeting with all of the Krista and Linda Klein and everybody going, OK, this is what we're thinking. We're going to come back to work in August. And I just remember that first meeting, like we all turned to Linda Klein, who's our medical expert. And we said, OK, so, Linda, what do we do? What are we going to be doing? And everybody kind of collectively in this moment, even though we'd done a ton of work, there was all these questions and unknowns. You you know, you remember that, Krista? You remember that? And we were all just like, oh, wow, we get to have another meeting and get some kind of real COVID pandemic expert in here to help us. Because we were all, and I think that really made me realize that, you know, when these things, these events, these once in a century pandemics happen, you know, hopefully it's another century. You know, it it it, it reflect. It really woke me up to when we play these characters. Like these doctors and, and 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 first responders usually know what to do. They're trained. But in this, I think a lot of people, it was kind of we were all learning as we went. You know, this last year has been this incredible learning and humbling. It's kind of like you know nature. You know, Mother Nature really is the boss, and we're all just clinging on to this big rock that spins around the sun you know so that i just found that really profound that meeting even though you know so 
I think I'll, I'll, uh, I'll jump in and say, uh, you know, to add to what Boris was saying, there's a tremendous courage um, and Krista is just, you are, you're just so courageous. Uh, I think, you know, we entered into this in a, a huge unknown. Um, and uh, Krista is such a sort of co collective um, uh, collaborator uh, and, but, but has such uh, incredible instincts on how to tell story of sort of the important things in life and how we come to those collectively, uh, globally, um, and still entertain, right? Um, and that's where as an artist, I remember uh, I was doing a show called Third Watch during 9-11 and I, I felt this tremendous um, sense of, oh my God, and I'm just an actor and I feel like, you know, this sort of world, you know, once in a lifetime uh, traumatic event is happening. And I felt sort of so insignificant in, in wanting to help. Um, and then, uh, you know, we were very close with a lot of the firefighters and a lot of the first responders. And uh, we went down and, you know, made sandwiches and handed out water. And uh, then John Wells, our, um, our, our showrunner, ended up doing a, a huge tribute. And I, I realized kind of in that moment, um, you know, our part is telling stories and, and bringing us together as one through storytelling. And I, I again, never thought I would be part of such a, a, a crazy once in a lifetime experience in such an unknown. I remember March 12th, we were shut down and Kevin and I were working together and they were like, okay, two weeks, we'll be back and cut to, you know, 16 months later and we're still in it, right? Um, and I have to say with uh, Krista as our fearless leader, uh, and the ability to tell stories uh, with such insight and with such courage and such collaboration, and our crew and our and and, and all you know all three of her shows, the crews uh, and the cast and uh, production offices, sort of committed to telling these stories and the importance of telling these different stories within this once in a lifetime to what Boris was saying, not, there are many traumatic events happening within this last year. So to feel once again that, oh, okay, well, my, my small part in it is, mm -hmm. is storytelling and to be able to be in a show where I feel like that actually means something has, has, has been incredible. And Krista, um, you know, you're making decisions about where you're going to take the show during this time and other shows haven't touched the pandemic or have done time jumps and that sort of thing. Was there any hesitation around focusing so heavily on real world events or was it a no brainer? Uh, it was not a no brainer. Um, it was uh, it was a constant conversation inside my head for months uh, while we were on hiatus. And I went back and forth and back and forth. Um, it, it's funny, it, it, the, I, it makes me laugh because I'm so often described as a fearless leader, but like I have a pretty serious anxiety disorder. I have a lot of fear. I'm just really brave. I'm just really brave around that fear. So I listen to the fear and then I, I listen to other people. And, and the one, what I think I bring as an artist is a, um, uh, a willingness to listen and take the best idea that I bring a, a true spirit of collaboration. And so I came into the writer's room. The first room to meet was the Grey's Anatomy room. And we had multiple doctors in that room. And I was like, you guys, I'm walking on the beach and I'm feeling all my feelings and I'm going home at night and I'm watching Schitt's Creek. <laughs> I'm watching The Good Place. Like I'm watching the most escapist sort of vapid, funny TV that I can because that my empathy for the world, I'm at a breaking point all the time and I need relief. And I 
feel that the rest of the world might need relief too. And I don't know that we should do this pandemic on screen. And I'm like 51, 49, and I can't decide, but I'm tipping toward not doing it. And I made my little speech. It sounded a lot like that. And then I said, who wants to be really brave and convince me that I'm wrong? And one by one, almost all the hands in the room went up. And the most persuasive, uh, well, there were two, there, there was a writer who pitched just a creative angle in that made me understand how we could entertain, as Kim said, and elevate and educate and, and, and that there was maybe a way to do both, that there was maybe a way to have delightful entertainment that could be a distraction and tell the truth of what was happening in the world. And then the doctors uh, all said, you know, Nasser, Dr. Nasser Al-Azari was on the front lines. He was working with COVID patients in a clinic. And he said, this is the medical story of our time. This is, um, this is changing medicine permanently. And we have a responsibility to the frontline workers. We have a responsibility to the world. We cannot be the biggest medical show in the world and not do the biggest medical story of our time. We have to do it. And so within about 15 minutes, I was like, all right, that's what we're doing. And there was never a conversation of doing one or two episodes and then skipping forward. No, if we're doing a thing, we're doing it. And, and, then, and then George Floyd was murdered. And the next part of the conversation was, are we doing this on screen? How are we doing this on screen? We've locked ourselves squarely, squarely, squarely in 2020. And so we're not going to do one thing and not do another thing. That would be racist. Like it would just be, we would be a part of the problem. So then it became, how do we be a part of the solution? Um, in a way that In a, in a way that feels authentic and and doesn't add to pain. So it, it, it was a very different writer's room this year to, to, want to, to want to look at these things but not somehow add to anyone's pain. Um, and you had to make a lot of those decisions for not one, but three shows, which is, I don't know how you do it, <laughs> but um, how it's was that? If anybody's wondering, it's just <laughs> stupid. Yeah. How was that? How was that experience? And you launched a new show. How? Yeah. How was that? Well, so by the time we were shooting Rebel, there was a vaccine. So what we did is we added, we knew that by the time we were airing, we were going to be not totally in a post pandemic world, but we basically decided to add a little dialogue about gratitude for the vaccine and not do masks because these actors will tell you it's a lot. The masks on camera, it's just a lot. So um, Rebel Rebel is looking at, at different, at a whole other uh, social justice situations that need attention. And, and we did, and, and we're not, and we're not in the midst, in the middle of COVID on that show. And we're not dealing with first responders and frontline workers. So it's, it's just, it's all different. And about the, I had a question about the PPP, PPE actually. I mean, you all already shoot scenes when you're doing surgery with the mask and that sort of thing, but now it's so much a part of every scene. And how did you adapt to that? Especially like showing emotion and acting through your scenes with even more on than normal. Well, I'll say that from the, uh, having been a doctor and a firefighter, because you know, uh, I have ADD apparently, according to Krista, um, the bizarro uh, Ben Warren has uh, professional ADD. Uh, when you're the, when you're when we're performing the surgical scenes, you're wearing a mask, and it's this bonus because if you flub your line, you can fix it in post later on because nobody knows what's happening with your mouth. You can cover your you know your mouth is covered in. We called it uh, not just eye acting; it's eye acting uh, when you're just looking intently around the room at the things, and that's fun because you can get through. Uh, even even if you're floundering, you can uh, you can find your way. Station 19, we don't normally wear masks. We'll sometimes wear uh, our oxygen masks connected to our SCBA, and that's annoying in a whole other realm because so much of your face is obscured. Uh, it's the entire thing; it's reflection on the light. Uh, so our our directors of photography, cinematographers, have to fight to actually get shots of our face and that sort of thing. You've got to really work on your volume and your diction in order to get the sound out of there. And then 
along comes COVID, where we've got a world where all of the above are happening and everybody's in a mask. And suddenly what doing surgical scenes used to be this kind of way we could cheat a little bit, you come to hate. You hate it with every fiber of your being. We, nobody likes the mask, but nobody hates the masks more than actors hate the mask. Um, and then uh, we also have to wear these shields and everybody's got a different version of a shield. We ended up with these, on station 19, we've got these uh, shields that come in between takes when we have our masks off. And they look like the cones that dogs wear when they've had surgery and you, you don't want them to scratch themselves. You just feel like an idiot. You can't really get around it. Uh, and we wear that just for a few minutes in between takes, figuring out when we needed to take off the stuff. You know, sometimes bringing in the masks and taking the masks off was more of a pain in the neck than it was worth because we only cut camera for all of 30 seconds. So it was a learning curve for everybody on all fronts from performing all the way to production. I mean, I, the one I pity is our steady cam operator on station 19 is this gentleman named Ron, who is diesel. And every steady cam operator, they go from these are, they carry 40 pounds off the side of their body, just dead arming it all day. They're, they're tough people. He has to do it now in a mask and a shield. And it's just, I've never seen him so hurt and miserable. And every time I thought that I was hating wearing the mask and feel it, I would look at him and I would say, suck it up because Ron's got it worse. And everybody, I think, in the cast and crew had somebody else they could look at who had a more difficult job. You know, our craft services, how do you feed and have snacks for an entire crew when nobody can come in to get it. So now you've got to personally, so now it's just this open store and it's, you've got to individually wrap everything and hand them out. And it just became, it was a nightmare that eventually became the normal and everybody figured it out and came together and we had a great time. I have to say that that was a, a really, a really big thing, you know, um, like, there's so many times where there's just so many layers on you all the time. You know, the first, like you could feel yourself inside just going, ah! and I think every single person on every single layer, just like, or in every show had to kind of find the way to kind of get through the, ah! <laughs> like, you know what I mean? And, you know, this used to be kind of the place where like you work hard hours, you're all together, you're joking. And, you know, Christy, even in the beginning said, it's going to be a lot different this year, you know? And I didn't quite realize it till like just yesterday, Kevin and I were doing a scene and now a lot of people are getting vaccinated and everyone like everyone knows the protocol and like we've all come together and you just kind of get through that annoying thing because you're so grateful because you're working and you're healthy and anytime you get annoyed you're like but i'm not a real doctor really fighting covid so suck it up but kevin and i yesterday we had like it was the first out loud belly laugh that we both had and the whole crew had and i went home and i was like oh my god like it's so great there's like there's hope on the horizon. There's like, we're coming out of it. And it's like looking back on like, you know, we're all, we all were just doing it because you gotta do it. Like, and I feel like, again, there's such a spirit of co like collective community ensemble across the board of like, this ain't easy. Like this year, this, you know, this like making this, it's like a, it's like wearing the back, you know, like when you're learning how to like hike up a cat men do and they like, you put a backpack on and they keep on putting things on and you gotta like, you gotta suck it up. There is no like, I don't wanna wear this. I know this is that one. It's just like, shut up, go out, do your work, let's go, right? But so there is a really, um, there is a, a yesterday, right, Kevin, there was like this sense of like, I don't know, like, like relief, like we, we're coming out of it. We know how to walk with the backpack mm -hmm. with 150 pound weight and like we're laughing again. Mm -hmm. And it's yeah. so great. It is just yeah. so great. Yeah, because the, the, the first few months of the whole thing where everybody's learning this huge learning curve, I'm sure it's the same as Station 18, like these people who aren't normally there, which are our COVID experts who are there to kind of marshal us, to remind us 
when we get too involved in the work to put your mask on, put your visor on when you're directing, like I do sometimes. And, you know, it was intense. And as you say, like, it was some practical joking going on yesterday that everybody got involved in. And it suddenly felt like, yeah, totally. And it, it just, it's, it's, it's been, it's brought everyone closer together. And I just want to do a shout out for the, all that team, this new team that all our shows have of these COVID. I don't even know what they're, they're kind of our COVID experts. Safety, kind of, safety and health. The, 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 safety the COVID, and health guys. The COVID compliance What's their official officers. Name? And, their and official name. There you go. They're amazing. And they've become part of us. Yeah. They're part of the family now. That's the one thing I'm going to be sad about when COVID ends, finally, <laughs> is that they won't be around because they've become part of the family. You know, they yeah. yell at me all the time because when I'm directing, especially, I'm fine with the mask when I'm acting, but when I'm directing, it's so involved and I have to go on and tell an actor a thing. And then I'm always getting like the shepherd's hook. <laughs> Somebody going, put your visor on, you know, and they're amazing. And they have to tread this incredible path, especially with, you know, temperamental people like actors and writers <laughs> um but they do it with this you know and it's just this huge as you say kim just this incredible team effort i feel really blessed to be in to be part of it yeah, we call them the copo the, the covid police the we, call them, the, we call them the covid police the copo the copo and we had our rap party yesterday and one of the boris did you uh mike who's one of the copo who's actually a really sweet guy but you never, we've never seen the bottom half of his face. And when his mask came off, right. he has the best porn stash ever. His porn mustache <laughs> was spectacular. And we said, Mike, well done. Get some. Go ahead, baby. Sort of similar, similar to yours right now, actually. I look at <laughs> right, it. Right? <laughs> right? <laughs> That's the other thing. I keep seeing people now in the crew. Like just the other day, I saw somebody eating a sandwich outside. And it's like, and I've been working with that person now for five months. And I only yesterday saw their whole face and didn't recognize them. So there's this weird, just very weird layer of stuff going on. I think it's, I think what, what also helps is to just get a little dose of perspective, you know, how lucky we are and, and, and just live in that gratitude because there's millions and millions and millions of people who are really struggling you know, all through this pandemic, you right. know, forced to be able to work and to play make believe. And it's not like we're, we're doing, you know, 48 hour shifts and, and fighting fires for real, you know? Mm -hmm. but so, so I, I always keep that in mind, you know, when I drive to work and it, for me, it's, it's actually, um, it's sort of a nice part of my day when I get to, you know, hang out with my, my, my said family and, and, um, collaborate and 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 just participate in something that's positive just for a little bit mm -hmm. yeah my family got so jealous when i actually got to leave the house and go to work everyone exactly. in my house my kids my, my wife everyone was like yeah you go see people we don't do that anymore we <laughs> so yeah thankful is definitely the word no and boris your character is also kind of dealing with addiction during this time and going to aa meetings virtually which is a difficulty that I don't know that everyone is thinking about, but is incredibly difficult. And how, how was it portraying that? And what research did you do around that? Um, you know, I have, I have, I have a couple of friends who've dealt with addiction and I guess the, the underlying or, or the baseline of it is, is really that as long as you um, can't admit that you're not in control, you'll never be in control. So that's sort of the through line, you know, that, that all of them sort of shared with me that it takes a long time for you to admit to yourself, not, not even to other people, but to, to, to yourself that there's an issue um, and that you're not managing and you're not in control. And for Sullivan, you know, he's, a, he's an alpha dog. He's somebody who's in charge, who is, who prides himself to be disciplined and by the book and in uh, prides himself to to have integrity and principles. So for him, it's 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 really a, a a very sort of sober look in the mirror to see himself, you know, all the way in the mud and not in control and overdosing and having to face that and then having to face those who he loves and um go through that um 
And then there's the dance that he does, you know, uh, where he he's not perfectly honest with the person he loves and wants to keep it to himself because he doesn't want to be vulnerable. He doesn't want to be exposed. And that's a whole other level now of, of, of hiding from the truth that he's going through. Um, to me, it's, it's great. You know, I love, I love playing these layers. I love playing characters who are, who are perfectly flawed because we all are, you know, so to represent that, um, you know, also as a black man, because, you know, in our, in our culture, um, black men are sort of expected to represent a certain standard. Uh, and that means not talking about flaws, not talking about weakness, vulnerability. You're not, you're not supposed to cry. We don't go to the doctor, right? We don't talk about health issues. Um, so, so it's, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of responsibility. Um, but, you know, I love what the writers come up with. Um, speaking of what the writers come up with, um, Teddy Altman had quite a time this season personally and professionally. And one of my favorite episodes of the season has been the kind of more conceptual episode after she's totally exhausted and had her mental break. Um, Krista, I was wondering, you know, these conceptual episodes are kind of part of Grey's DNA. How do you make the decision to kind of break from your normal form, Matt, to serve a character in the story that way? Um, it, it usually because a writer has a pitch that's so strong, I go, cool, <laughs> do that. And that's what happened here. It was, it was Tammy Duffy's idea. I think I said... Teddy's going to have a nervous breakdown. Like I, I, I think I came into the season knowing that, that in order to bring Teddy back from how she'd been behaving, we had to go very deep into her psychology. And, um, but the, but, but Tammy Duffy who wrote that episode really pitched the shape of it in such a way that it felt like, oh yeah, let's do that. We call them the centric episode, the character centric episode and uh and kevin directed that episode so beautifully kim acted it so beautifully it was it, it's i i feel like um like my job is like uh, like when i was little um my my preschool teacher called my mom because um they were worried about me because they couldn't get me away from the arts and crafts table <laughs> like my mom came to school and like every other little kid had like three or four pictures on the wall and i had like 45 and the way I feel in my job is like I somebody gave me the greatest arts and crafts room in the world like these actors are the paint and the writers are the paintbrushes and it's just like oh my god all I just get to play and because they bring it they bring such talent and depth and passion and 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 perspective uh, you know, so much of this season was shaped by so much of Kim's journey. Teddy's journey was shaped by conversations with Kim. So much of what we did on Station 19 was shaped by conversations with that cast. I, 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 I can't. Um, you're a film festival, so I guess what I want to say is to artists who are making their films, this the idea that you, that it's just you're an auteur and it's all you is a is a false narrative. The truth is, the best art comes when you when you play with everything you're given, and that includes the minds and the hearts and the talents of all the all the people you're working with. Yeah, and for Kevin and Kim, you obviously have a lot of your scenes together when you're acting in the show. What is it like coming together to collaborate on an episode like that? And Kevin, is it difficult to transition into director mode? Uh, you want to go first, Kim? <laughs> it was hard. That episode was hard. I thought what Christy, you just said there was so beautiful. And I think that's when I, when that script landed on my lap, firstly, I felt fear and I haven't <laughs> felt afraid about directing an episode of Grey's in quite some time. So I've directed quite a few and I was like, Oh, this is a good thing. This is a good thing that I'm feeling fear right now, mm. you know? Um, and what I did, which is exactly what Krista just said was I went to all these departments and listen, you know, our show, we tell varied stories, but, you know, our crew, they, they, you know, they know how to do this. They've been doing it for all these seasons. And this one was like, okay, what are we going to do here? 
because this is this dreamscape kind of Jacob's laddery kind of, you know, um, sort of through the looking glass episode. And I feel proud that I think, you know, I went to each department, costume, hair, everyone, and, and said, what do you think to our DP? And, and everybody, I think, really loved that. Like, I didn't go, here's my idea. This is how it's going to be. I just went, you've all done this show for years and years and years. What do you think would be cool? You know, and I would pick and choose just exactly as Krista said. And that was such an amazing um, collaboration, you know. And then we had to do some reshoots because it was such an out-of-the-box episode. It was almost like shooting a pilot. And, you know, Krista, I think Krista and I really collaborated to get that right. And it was amazing, but, but scary. <laughs> and Kim was amazing. I mean, Kim, Kim Raver is just, I don't, don't get me started on Kim Raver. She's the, the pro of all pros. I love her dearly. Thank you, Kevin. Um, for me, I mean, you, to get an episode like this is just a true gift. I mean, talk about gratitude. I, and, and on top of it, to have uh, Krista as your showrunner and her key thing is collaboration and then to have Kevin directing it in collaboration. I think it was my favorite episode because it was, not because I'm in every scene practically, right? But like, it, it was like, an actor's dream because, you know, I would, I would get it and I'd see a scene and I would text Krista and I, 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 I just sort of was saying, and here's the feeling of this and why this and why, and she's like, I got it, I got it, yeah. And then she would, you know, write these pages and I'd read that and I was like, oh my God, she's got it, she's got it, like, you know, and then, uh, because same sort of thing, I read it and I was like, oh, I, I, I understand this completely. And then the table read, I was, in terror and I told I was like oh my god wait this is so different it's snowing in the OR and she's having like a mental breakdown and you know what is that and then again to go to Boris's point like I I love I love people were like oh you know Teddy is cheating and women are che and I was like I love it she's so flawed like why is she so flawed we're all so flawed right so for for me to have the opportunity to get into side the layer of the onions of why this messed up behavior rather than the moral judgment of the behavior, right? And, and it is mental health month, May. So, right, I, so to be able to talk about it and destigmatize it is, is so important. And again, it goes to the point I made about Krista of, of finding important things to talk about, not just because, oh, that's the thing to talk about now, but it's really centric to this character. Um, and one of also my favorite things in it is uh, what Amelia says to Owen. Owen is unable in that moment to understand other people's trauma. He understands that he has trauma and he has PTSD, but that Teddy's is presenting itself in this messed up behavior. It's not understandable until Amelia points out that, that, that Teddy is, is presenting her trauma, her grief in another way. And I think it, it's important that, yes, that's not an excuse for her behavior, but it's an explanation. So for me to be able to, to get into the, the, the mechanics of the way this character works and also it being so relevant to what's happening in the world. I mean, that episode to me was about trauma, about grief, about how does it manifest if it's not unlocked and, and then forgiveness. And, and so now we have, because they, because Krista and the writers gave this gift, it's like now my character, here, here we're in a show of 17 years and a lot of those shows that only go five years, you're repeating the same thing over and over, right? So it, you know, two filmmakers, out there, the, the, the beauty of the fact that to find sort of that fulcrum to, to expose a character and now to have Teddy and Owen be able to launch into a new place of healing, it just, it just was sort of a magical episode for me. And, and it touched on so many current themes, I think in our, our world today. And for me to be able to um, 
understand Teddy. And also I, I had gone, you know, uh, Krista touches base with us about sort of what stories do you want to tell? And um, that's also another amazing opportunity. A lot of showrunners don't do that. And I said, I feel like there's so much of, of Teddy's history that we don't know yet. And so to be able to kind of unlock that too, just I felt like expanded Teddy in who she was. And to work with Kevin was, the, it's just the greatest gift. I, I don't know any other director who can literally be in a scene looking at you completely present as an actor and then say, okay, wait, move the camera over there and then still be like doing a scene with you. And I think also our... Teddy Owen relationship is just so organic and free and easy. And I, I, I feel like I've expanded as an actor because we have such a trust and such a sort of unique, you know, and he's teaching me directing while we're acting. And it, it's really, it's, it's just, uh, it's, it's been such a, a wonderful um, season. And, and again, to go to Boris is saying like, what a, what a gift in such a difficult time to have the opportunity to be able to tell these stories and, and be able to collaborate. And I think it's brought us together in, in, a, in a very different way as well. It's amazing to hear how collaborative the process always is. I feel like that's pretty rare. Um, there's, you know, I really want to talk about the episode of Station 19, Get Up, Stand Up, which is a incredible episode of television. And I read the Hollywood Reporter piece that you did, Krista, on the making of that episode and how collaborative it was and how you had everyone kind of send their stories into you. And I just want to hear from you and Jason and Boris, what was that process like of contributing to a story that is obviously also so upsetting and hard to talk about? Wow, okay, I'll start. Um, that was a huge um, milestone um on the show because again uh, i still i keep going back to uh, courage because for a showrunner to say you know what uh we've established the tone of the show over years and years it's been successful guess what i'm going to throw all this stuff away for this one episode i'm going to do something completely different it takes a lot of guts to do that because you have a lot of people in your ear um now that sort of laid the foundation for us to be encouraged and empowered to speak our truth and to share our personal experiences, which are very different from person to person. Um, there's fathers and husbands, there's single people, there's women, there's men, and everybody has their own experience with this other pandemic, right? Um, and I also realized that Representation is not enough, right? Because uh, it just scratches the surface of who we are in terms of our versatility and diversity. Um, I think the goal was to, to normalize our voice and to normalize blackness, if you will, right? Because normalizing blackness means um, asking for equal awareness of who I am as a, as a human being. Um, and that my experience is completely different than yours, but it's not, it shouldn't be valued uh, any less. And uh, it's funny, my, my, my 16 year old daughter wrote, wrote an essay about her hair and she asked, we've, we've been here together for 400 years, funny enough, Virginia, 1619. Um, and you know nothing about me and I know everything about you. And the metaphor was her hair because she knows everything about her white girlfriend's hair and they don't know anything about hers. And they call her hair crazy and wild and unruly and all these things, they label her hair and she got spit at. So, so norm, the normalizing of blackness, I think, is something that we were able to touch on in the episode as it pertained to our experience with this murder. And it was, it was super powerful. And it forced people to change their mindset from being um, colorblind, which has been in the past an objective, 
to throwing it out the window and saying, no, no, we don't want to be colorblind anymore because that doesn't serve us. We want to be color conscious. We want to be conscious because only if we're conscious can we practice awareness. Can we practice empathy? Can we practice equity and, and equality in the end? Uh, so it was a tremendously empowering when, when Krista basically told us, um, tell me what you feel, share it with me in your own words, and we will try to put a show together that represents that as authentic, off, give me the, give me the adjective. Authentically. Thank you. And as, as true and real as possible. So it was, it was a really, again, it was an empowering and it was an, it was a, it was a very fulfilling um, experience for me. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to double down on that. And I'm actually going to, um, I mean, look, you talk about, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion. It used to just be about diversity until people realized just showing up to the point that representation is not enough. Just having somebody there, but if you're not using them, if you're not actually pulling something out of them, if they're not actually seen as equal, that's where the equity and inclusion piece is. That's why it's now a DEI conversation, not just a diversity conversation. The equity and inclusion is important. And when you're talking about collaboration, again, we, this is the Virginia Film Festival, talking to uh, people who are artists, collaboration is the word. Collaboration is the greatest joy of art in any way. Even if it's a solo thing you do, there's an audience and there's a conversation happening between you and that audience. That's the thing you need to remember always is that that conversation is the thing. And we have these, right now in our country, we're having this conversation. We keep saying, we're saying the platitudes and we have to actually live it. We're talking this talk, but we have to walk it. Have the uncomfortable conversation. And I have never in 25 years in this business ever had a showrunner really own mistakes to the cast, talk about it with the cast, turn that into a piece of art, put it out there in the world, and then in an interview and in an article, talk about the mistakes and how they owned it and the art that came from it. And so it was the definition of having that uncomfortable conversation, leaning into it, pushing through and something beautiful coming out on the other side and sharing that process and having that process be an empowering thing for others. And I hope it's a blueprint. I mean, along with you, know, and, and I'll, I'll continue to blow more smoke up your skirt, Krista, um, <laughs> that uh, Kasha, uh, that she has uh, brought into her staff uh, a person whose position is to be there to call her to task in terms of the diversity, equity, inclusion in the content of the art. In read, read the scripts and say, here's where I think you're kind of going astray when it comes to the, the gender parity. Here's where I think the Asian character is not getting love. Here's what's happening with the, the black folks to literally just, Krista hired somebody to call her out on a regular basis, which to me, I'm floored by that regularly. And I, 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 I say that, but at the same time, I knew I was gonna enjoy my time with Krista. The first meeting we had when she came on as the showrunner of Grey's Anatomy, this would be six years ago, Krista, something like that. And we went out to a lunch and she told me a little story about when she started at Grey's a million years ago in the original writer's room of Grey's, she would, you know, people argue in the writer's room, that's kind of their job is to throw things, throw ideas around, banter ideas around. But at the end of the day, you know, the showrunner calls the shots. The showrunner is the boss. And people get very delicate about when the, when the showrunner says, well, I think we should do this. They go, yeah, absolutely. That's exactly what we should do. That's, yeah, that's a brilliant idea, even if it's not. And Krista said that she and Shonda, when she came back, she went off and had a life out in the world, learned from other people, made successes of her own, worked on other shows, came back. And when she got with Shonda, she said, Shonda said to her, uh, do you remember this, Chris? She said, Shonda said to her, the reason why I wanna leave this show in your hands is because you were the only one who would argue with me when you thought I was wrong. You were more afraid of screwing up the show than you were afraid of me. And that's important. And the, I want all of you who have any interest in being 
a creative or even a boss in any way, a manager of other people, a supervisor of any kind, take that gift, challenge your people. They gotta be respectful. They gotta have their stuff together. They gotta be intelligent and on point and, have, uh, and, and make their point, but best idea wins. And so when we got around to this conversation and we beat it up on how do we introduce the conversation about George Floyd properly and honor not just the man, but the entire situation, because it's bigger than George Floyd, as anybody will tell you, as anybody in the Floyd family will tell you. It's about the situation that's been going on for the last 400 some years in this country. So how do we honor that in a way? And she opened it up and it was just ended up being this, you know, leaning into that hard conversation, that uncomfortable conversation and a beautiful piece of art came out of it. And the fact that she took all of our thoughts and helped turn it into a thing and then turned around and tried to get 25 different people credit on the episode. She tried to get writing credit for 25 different people, which the Writers Guild wouldn't let her do. Uh, but she went ahead and still put a card on the show that said, all these people contributed to this episode because it's about all of us. And that to me is the message of this bigger movement that we're in, which is it's about all of us. And we've all got to recognize and empathize with each other's stories and put it out there and continue to have the conversation. So with that, Krista, I've now put you up on the pedestal. Say something. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I'll, uh, I get, I, I, I mean, what am I supposed to say? Thank you. Thank you. I'll sleep well tonight. Uh, I love you. I, I, here's, here's what I'll say. Um, all of those decisions that you just described, including the hiring of Kasha, were born of mistakes that I made rooted in ignorance that was rooted in white supremacy. That's the truth. The, the ground that we stand on is built on white supremacy. And so um, what I mean by that is like, I hired a very diverse writing staff when I came and, and took over station 19, the cast was very diverse and I wanted a very diverse room. And I wrote an episode, um, <laughs> I wrote an episode of TV and I had uh, Oak's character, Dean, uh, give a monologue about what it is to be a Nigerian American. I'm sorry, I'm laughing at the memory because I brought it to the writer's room and I love notes. Like I expect all my writers to note my scripts the way I note their scripts. I want, I want everybody's take. And so I bring it to the writer's room, but it's a new group of people. It's a new staff. And, uh, and I'm like, what did you think of this? What'd you think of that? <laughs> what did you think of this, you know, monologue? And, um, and there are, there are, you know, black writers in the room. And one of them was like an expert in that particular area. And he goes, yeah, I mean, let's see what Oak thinks, but yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, cool. I'm like, great. I think that means I'm good. I did a good job here. I go back to my office and Kasha, who's my assistant at the time, knocks on my door. I love Kasha. She's like, she's like my aged, which is helpful. She's a, she's like a grown up, and she was having a life change. And it was a strange thing that she was my assistant because she had this whole world of experience in independent theater. And, and, and I, um, she knocked on my door and I said, yes. And she came in and she said, I've been sitting outside your door for four or five months now. And I've come to believe that you're a pretty decent human being, but those writers don't really know you. And they all worked really hard to get their jobs. And there are power dynamics in Hollywood that make it almost impossible for writers of color to tell the truth to their white showrunner. And I believe that you want the truth. And I'm wondering if you're willing to hear it from me because they're not telling it to you. And she said it with so much respect for those writers and that, you know, a hundred years, hundreds of years of history in Hollywood would have those writers fired for telling most white showrunners their truth. That's what I mean by white supremacy. So I, I had hired all the people, like Jason said, diversity, but the equity and, and inclusion is about creating a culture where people feel safe to tell you the truth and where they don't feel responsible to always tell you the truth. They don't want to, I, I, they don't want to always have to, I know as a woman in writer rooms that were mostly men, I didn't always want to have to raise my hand and go, your women suck. Like they suck and they don't sound like women. <laughs> you just want to talk about the world of the show and, and, and the plot the way all the other writers are, right? So you don't want to hold the responsibility for your whole gender, 
black writers don't want to hold the responsibility for their whole race and so off, often all the all the other people of color in the cast so anyway kasha said to me can i tell you the truth and i was like yes please and she basically said this writing is lazy and damaging you haven't done enough research and i was like wow really tell me more <laughs> Like, and she was like ready. She she says she was ready to be fired. But I was like, tell me, tell me, tell me. And I did multiple rounds of rewrites from her notes. And I knew I had to promote her to a job where I figured in the way that you try to begin to make up for hundreds of years of cultural awfulness is to go, what can I do to be a part of the solution? I can pay someone whose whole job it is to tell me that truth. So all of that weight isn't on the writers. So it, it, it's that, that's, it's, it's all, it's when Kasha said to me, when, when George Floyd was murdered, she, we were in the writer's room at Rebel. And she said to me, sitting in that room with those wonderful human beings, those white writers who think, who I think of as like woke people, they're liberal. And realizing how little they understand about black culture, she was like, it's, it sent me like back to therapy, like the realization of just how bad it is. And so we have to own that and we have to do everything we can to change, to change it. So this episode is, I'm so proud of the group effort of this episode. And I think this episode will be talked about for a long time and, and, but I'm not like, so proud of me. I'm I'm so proud of the opportunity and and at, that ABC gate. Like I'm just I'm just grateful to everyone because we found this thing together and it wasn't for a lack of making mistakes. It's just for a willingness to try to make things right. Thank you. Yeah. Um so we have a record number of attendees on this Zoom and I want to give them some time to kind of go through some of their questions. Um, Vicki Shabo said that both Grays and Station 19 have done an incredible job this season of dealing with the pandemic, dealing with health and racial justice questions, and still maintaining a sense of humor and levity sometimes with some characters. What process did the writers use to strike that balance? And, shoot, it went away. <laughs> and how did you know that would be right and resonant? Uh, uh, th the process was, uh, there was a mandate, I made a mandate. Like if we're doing a pandemic amidst a pandemic, we at least have to laugh sometimes and find ways to also be sexy. So that was like, go come up with ways to tell stories about the pandemic that culminate in sex or sexy or funny. That was a big part of it. But thank It's like we're, we're dealing with it every single day in our real life, right? Yeah. But I'm still sexy. See what I mean? <laughs> if he does say so himself. <laughs> Tell us what you really think. There's just sexiness yeah. in supply closets with masks on now. <laughs> That's it. I will, I will say the, the behind the scenes, you, you realize how much you miss hugs because you can't hug people because we're a big hugging cast at Station 19. And so I think there became a thing where like, you know, again, acting, like eyeballing somebody, I, I, I effing somebody became a thing uh, with masks. And I think, I, I think if there's a survey across the globe, I think everybody's up there, there I, I can eyeball you across the room and th that game has been upped a little bit. I don't need to smile, I don't need to... It's gonna be all here for a little bit. Um, here's an interesting one. Um, Joha asked, Kim and Kevin got some scenes with with their on-screen fictional children, is there a different protocol with working with them because of COVID? Yeah, uh, you can't, there's certain ages that you can't. Uh, mm. So Allison went from a little itty bitty baby to a toddler <laughs> and she's, we go out the foot, she's fantastic. Um, so yeah, there's definitely more health and safety uh, COVID protocols with kids. And you, you can, you, I think it's, we use them less, right, Kevin? You would know more, I think more. A lot less, yeah, a lot less. And also we've had quite a few baby, like there's Luna, who's Joe's, you know, the, the baby that Joe's very attached to. And we're not allowed to have, you know, I think there's a limit. You can't have, we used to be able to have newborns for very small windows. 
you can't have that at all. So now we're leaning heavily on these um, special effects houses to create these amazing animatronic um, robot babies, basically, <laughs> who look amazing, you know? Um, so it's, it's just this, everybody's having to be innovative to get to work the problem, you know? And but those babies outside. are freaky looking. The babies are freaky looking. <laughs> they scare me. <laughs> I think, you know, with all of the kids in uh, the sister house, uh, I think if you, I think pretty much they're always filming outside with them also to add to the safety. So the kid, a lot of the kids stuff, they created a whole backyard and they film all of the stuff outside. That was the huge change on Grey's Anatomy this year was was coming was coming up with ways to create and utilize outdoor sets mm -hmm. so that the actors because we came back so early the actors didn't feel safe working without their masks indoors. So we, so it's the first time in 17 seasons that you've seen, you know, Meredith Gray's backyard. I, I remember the first day back, uh, Debbie Allen, the amazing Debbie Allen was directing us and it was Kevin and I, it was literally the first scene, first day back. And, and Kevin and I were like kind of doing scenes like this. And Debbie was like, get together. And I was like, I, 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 Kevin, I was like, it was so against what your whole body was, you know, you just like, it just took a while also to get comfortable being in close proximity of other people too. But there's a huge testing protocol and, uh, and they, you know, put a big, big chunk into testing and keeping everyone safe on set. Yeah, um, Quinn Ward asks, you know, on Station 19 and Grays, you've clearly created such a family atmosphere. How do you continue to make it feel like a home and keep that camaraderie with all the restrictions? Wow, it, um, I mean, you know, absence makes the heart grow fonder. So we, we had our rap party on Zoom yesterday and I forgot how much I'd been missing uh, the bottom half of people's faces. Uh, we would talk about it. Uh, I'm not gonna lie, I'm gonna rat myself out. Uh, the Copo were very understanding because I was hugging on the way out the door and we just got away with it. So it was a, we were still, we would talk about it. That's really what it came down to was that from day one, we would talk about how uncomfortable it was and does everybody feel safe? And if you ever feel unsafe, let's talk about it. And then we got to be normal and then we had to remind each other. And then we would, and also I give a lot of props to, uh, we have a great uh, AD staff of assistant directors, uh, Chris Kringle, they were really great about reminding everyone it's a blessing to be working. So let's give it up for the COVID compliance officers uh, because if they weren't here, we don't get to work. Let's give it up for the people who stick a thing up your nose every other day, because if they weren't doing it, you wouldn't get to work. And so we, it, we, you know, whereas we would normally only have a safety meeting when there was a stunt going to happen or some special occurrence, we had a safety meeting almost every day, certainly every other day, just so that everybody got reminded of these things. I gave an opportunity to laugh for actually all six feet apart, but all in the parking lot and just kind of circle the wagons and have a team meeting every morning in that safety, you know, that safety meeting, just to remind us we're blessed and you, you love these people. You, you've been working with them for four seasons now. And so just, you know, in, enjoy what we have. Yeah, Krista, there's a lot of questions in here about the beach. Um, Christine Dela Cruz was wondering what was the process of pulling in former cast members? for those scenes? Um, it was, uh, it, what was the process? For like, I texted old friends that it was really like, hey, <laughs> you know, Ellen, Ellen had the first conversation with Patrick cause they had, they had recently taken a hike and said, do you want to do this? Krista has this idea. And I texted, the other the other you know tr and 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 kyler and eric and just said like do you want to come play do you want to come do a thing and then business affairs had to make deals <laughs> um we've all been so generous with your time i just want to close out with one last question um so many of us have been able to distract ourselves from the events of the past year by throwing ourselves into work 
but your work has been very focused on the events of the last year. How do you, how do you take care of yourselves? How do you come down from that at the end of the day? That's a great question. Um, I think there's, it's going to take five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years for us to really realize the, the psychological effect that this time has had on us and especially our children, I think. Because, you know, I know, I know it's true for my children. Um, they're 14 and 16. And isolation is really, really tough for kids. And um, so I'm not sure how we are going to deal with it um, when some of that trauma sort of reappears. Um, we stay close, you know, uh, and we do stuff like, like what Kevin said earlier. We did the same thing. We went to Grand Canyon. And we do, you know, California is a great place if you like the outdoors. So there's tons and tons of things to do. Um, and we sort of consciously made a decision that every week we wanted to, do, we needed to do something to get out the house. Um, and, and then, you know, on set, it's really great to have people around you who you love and respect and to go through challenging times together uh, makes it easier because you can have honest and open conversations about your fears and concerns, hopes and dreams, and have somebody sitting across from you who cares about you, who will give you some feedback and who shares that experience. So I think that's, to me, for me, that, that has certainly helped. Yeah. I feel, I agree, um, Boris. It's like a <clears throat> the camaraderie and the community of, we we're so blessed that we get to have that with our coworkers, you know, and I think it's really, we were all close before. And I think this year has only brought everybody much, much closer, you know, um, and we kind of depend on each other. And you know, I heard a statistic the other day from, from our copos, as you call them, um, that statistically our shows, like we're doing a really good job, you know, we're taking care of each other. And I feel really proud of that. that we've had a very minimal positive, you know, test positivity rate on, I think both our shows. And that's a testament to the community and family that I think Krista and everybody, the culture that has been created there. So yeah, um, I actually weirdly, I get a lot of my, my sort of therapeutic help from going to work and being in a community of people. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll say I, uh, I, I, it has not been without a cost to work, to write about the pandemic while working in the pandemic, while living through a pandemic. Like, um, you know, one of my most reliable, most wonderful, most gifted writers is leaving because he's just deter it just deteriorated his well being and he needs a break. It it's not, it's not been, it's not. Like, I, I can't really overstate how difficult it's been on people's mental health to, to do this. And I, I, keep, I keep ringing the bell that, we're, that we've been of, ser of service to the world, that these, that these seasons of TV will be talked about for a really long time, that we were really brave, that we did our parts, that we did our parts to the, to the degree that an entertainer can, can, can do their part. We did our parts. And... Um, and now, you know, and now for me, just in terms of self-care, it's, it's, it's my self-care that, that led to this big, you know, beach storytelling. I put my feet in the sand and I walk at the ocean. And that's where all the imagining of Meredith's walks happened for me. And, and that's just, just being in nature and, and putting literally my feet on the earth is my primary form of self-care. And I highly recommend it. <laughs> Yeah. Kim, were you going to say something? Yeah, go ahead. Well, well I, um, along with the walks on the beach, um, my kids and, and my lady, I, I, I come home from work and uh, more times this year, I've had, I come home with a big smile on my face because, you know, you, you, I feel like we were, you know, what Chris, what Chris was just saying, I felt like we were putting something out there that was worthwhile, that I hope would be a service to someone else. And so I'd come home and I'd just crawl up underneath the kids 
Uh, and movie night has been uh, become series night. Well, I am watching The Crown with uh, a bunch of teenagers <laughs> and, and my wife re-watching The Crown. We've watched, I don't know how many different series over. And it was, movie night used to be Friday nights and now it's become get your work done because every night come about 8.30, 9 o'clock, we're gonna watch something together and just lay on top of each other and stop it and have conversations about what do we think about the world. And it's a lot of escapist fare, a lot of stuff that has nothing, you know, and that's, you know, you get your people, you get your people and, and they get you through it. That's, that's the reality. I was just gonna say, yes, definitely, you know, there is a, a, a cost and a weight. Um, I, I noticed that I, I felt this anxiety that sort of, um, uh, went out to my kids because I felt this enormous, which I put on myself, but I also felt this enormous pressure to protect my community, my other members and the crew and the show. And uh, so I, my kids carried that as well. You know, no, you can't go with your friends. No, you can't go play volleyball. No, you all lucky to have those things, but it definitely, um, you know, and also it was like doing a play almost like what, what Teddy was carrying, I was carrying, you know, what, but I, but I think to go back to mental health and mental health may um, bringing awareness, I, I think it also, um, it brought me to uh, have this group of women and, and be able to create a support system uh, of women friends to kind of download the different layers of anxiety and fear and, and, and bring me into gratitude. And, uh, and so I, I, think, I think this year has also brought us, while uh, a lot of trauma, I think it's also helped us find how do we want to live our life? What kind of life do we want to live? And I, and I think also the gratitude of going and having a community and, and, and that community of trust and support because you, you, really, you really had to trust one another that what you're doing on the weekend, you're protecting me. What I'm doing on the weekend is protecting you. And that's, I think, how, so, how we stayed safe throughout the school season. Um, so while there's been an enormous weight, I also feel this tremendous gratitude because I feel like it's revealed so much to me of, of what I need in community um, and having a community, community of women, community of work. Um, so I, I just, I guess I would just say that's been a, a, a tremendous healing and, and beautiful thing to come out of uh, such a tremendous year. Well, thank you all so much for taking so much time out of your busy schedules to do this for the Virginia Film Festival. You have created two incredible seasons of television and this panel has been such a joy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you guys for showing up. <laughs>